I'm Tom Hardy and you're watching the Venom Vlog. 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 The seat, my man. My man here. Thank you guys so much for being fans of the character that we all love so much. Thanks for watching. I enjoyed the show. Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Spitting Venom, aka the Venom Vlog. And today we're going to do a double feature real quick. I think I did a, like a slight review of this book uh, back when I was like did a Spider-Man stream uh, or Resident Evil stream or something. But since I kind of cut that footage out, I figured we'll go ahead and do it here and cover it on the show. This came out about a, maybe a couple weeks ago. It's the Venom Annual Number 1. Maybe it was about a month ago. And we didn't get to talk about it on the show. So I wanted to go through it real quickly, give you my thoughts on it. And then we'll go to the Venom Number 8 issue that just came out last week. And we'll talk about that. That way we should be caught up. And then that way after my bed rest and you know surgery and everything we can get into the web of carnage book that'll be coming out this week so i'll probably be like a week late on that but we'll get to it as soon as i possibly can uh but for today i want to talk about this venom annual real quick uh i don't have a lot to say about it because i'll be honest with you i really didn't like it <laughs> actually and i know surprise surprise because we talked about that on the show where i was very excited for donny cates to write venom and i know a lot of you guys are really digging the book but i keep finding myself on the fence i am not enjoying it nearly as much as all of you guys are and i think the reason reason is is because there's this like lack of attention to continuity at points um, there's uh, changing things for the sake of changing things which is fine I mean overall I can kind of get into the new stuff I don't mind Eddie Brock having like a younger brother possibly we're gonna probably see that pay off at some point down the road uh, but I don't want it to be at the detriment of losing his sister because I thought she was a very vital character to forming Eddie Brock as a human being and as a person uh, so yeah that's kind of weird to me that they would you know cut that we've talked about that numerous times so I'm sure you guys are sick of me mentioning it um, but at this point in the annual though uh, I was hoping all right you know everything we've seen in, in Venom so far it's been like for me it's been uh, Eddie Brock being tied to a chair or being held by Null or you know being uh, strapped to a chair by the maker and the story and plot just being told to him and he doesn't feel like an, an active member in his own story um, and it doesn't even feel like an Eddie Brock story it feels like if you switched him out for Flash Thompson or Matt Gargan you pretty much get the same story because it's really focusing on the suit more than it is Eddie. And everyone keeps saying, oh, I love the relationship between Eddie and the suit. But really, we only got a little bit of that in the first issue and maybe some of that in like the sixth issue. But in the middle, the suit was kind of controlled by Null. So it was acting out of, you know, out of control and out of character. Uh, and it, it was just something that he had to deal with. And then now it's like a sleep. So I, I don't think there is actually a strong relationship there that Donny Cates is writing between Eddie and the symbiote, at least to me. Um, but I know a lot of you guys feel differently, so that that's fine. If you do feel differently, let me know down below um, in the comments. But in this one, I was hoping because he was bringing back like David Michelini and Ron Lim and some other you know people that have you know not worked on Venom before and some that have, and I was kind of curious to see how they were going to intertwine all these like little short stories. And overall, I don't mind the framing of this story. It's kind of neat. It's like all right, it's a bunch of people at that bar for supervillains in the Marvel universe, and uh, and they're all just kind of hanging out, talking and sharing stories apparently about Venom. And I'm just going to go ahead and spoil something right now. There's Venom. Uh, this guy here dressed in this outfit, that's actually Venom. Uh, so that'll I'm pointing that out now because it's one of my issues with the story is how his reveal plays out. It's kind of weird. Uh, but basically what you have is a bunch of people, kind of like in Batman Almost Got Him, that episode from the animated series, where it's a bunch of people sitting around talking about how uh, they fought Venom and how scary he is. But really nobody tells a scary story with Venom. And what's even worse is Matt Gargan, probably the scariest Venom. I know a lot of people didn't like him um, as Venom, but he ate people and tormented people. And I know, you know, Eddie Brock tormented Peter Parker, but a lot of characters, you know, a lot of characters in the Marvel Universe don't know that he went to that level. Um, just maybe a couple do. But uh, but for the masses of the Marvel Universe, I would figure they knew that Matt Gargan was a member of the Thunderbolts uh, and the Dark Avengers, uh, you know, after that got revealed and that he ate people. Uh, so so I'm kind of curious why that wasn't, um, you know, like it's not a big focus here. And everyone's sitting around trying to convince Matt Gargan, I guess, that Venom is scary. And it's like, all right, that's kind of a neat framing device because it's Matt Gargan and he probably considers himself the scariest Venom. And so he's hearing all these people's stories. He's like, that doesn't sound scary. That doesn't sound scary. Uh, but the thing is, is that the stories actually aren't scary. It's it's a lot of stories where uh, it's like Black Cat. She's like, oh, let me tell you about this one time that I met Venom and he tormented me. So I wanted to get my revenge on him. But when I went back after him, um, you know, he turned out to be more on the good side at this point. And he saved my life uh, from some bad guys uh, because, uh, you know, I was kind of winded. I just, you know, got in a fight with him. I hadn't fully recovered yet. And, uh, and then after we get into this tussle these uh, criminals show up and venom stops them 
and I realize, oh, he's maybe actually uh, a little bit on the side of good now, and so he lets me live. And uh, he's like, hey, look, you know, you try to save innocent lives back there. I'm going to spare you this time. And then again, it's like, boom, you know, and Matt Gargan's like, okay, so he spared you and he has a good heart. So that makes him scary. And I agree. I'm kind of like, why would she tell that story? And this is a story written by David Michelini and the arts by Ron Lim. So the book starts off written by Donny Cates. The bar stuff is all written by Donny Cates. And then it switches artists and uh, and writers as it gets into these short stories. Um, so I was kind of like, ah, eh, that felt like kind of a weak story. I, I like David Michelini a lot. I like the story he told in Venom number 150, which we'll get to at some point down the road. Uh, but uh, this one, I just was like, ah, you know, it was cool to see Black Cat again. But uh, I don't know, it did, the story itself didn't do anything for me. And I can see why Matt Gargan wasn't like freaked out by it. Uh, but then you have Matt Gar the bartender saying, well, I remember a time where I was a bartender and Venom fought Wolverine. And then it's like Wolverine is in this bar. I guess it was a week after he fought the Hulk or something. So it's early on in his career. Um, and uh, which I thought happened technically before Venom came about. So I don't know what's going on here. Um, I don't know if the, the timeline or if it's that time he fought Hulk. You know, maybe it's not his origin when he first fought Hulk. Maybe it's like another time he fought Hulk. Uh, but uh, he is kind of in his yellow and blue. So, I, you know, whatever. Anyway, I like the artwork in this one a lot. And I always love seeing Wolverine fight Venom. But really what they're doing is Wolverine is saying like, oh, so somebody hurt you? And he's like, yeah, Spider-Man. He goes, yeah, but isn't Spider-Man 12? And he's like, but I tormented Spider-Man. He's like, who cares? It's a 12-year-old kid. And Wolverine's like, yeah, so what, dude? Like, pick on someone your own size. Like, you know, cry me a river. Someone wronged you. So what? Someone wronged me too. They deal with it. And he's like drinking a beer. And then Venom like pierces his heart from the other side and, and tosses him to the ground. And then, you know, Wolverine gets back up. He's like, all right, my heart's healing, but now I'm pissed off. And, uh, and he's like, uh, you know, I don't care who hurt you. I don't care what happened. Uh, but, you know, you need to, you know, some of those people that hurt you probably deserve to die. But, and he's like, and I've killed plenty. But at some point you got to ask yourself, am I going to be this? Am I going to be an animal or am I going to be more than an animal? So I guess Wolverine gave him like some kind of pep talk in the middle of their battle. And then was like, all right, you know, see you around goo head or whatever. And, uh, and then like Venom just, you know, is just left there on the floor in the bar. And again, it's like, it's like two stories where Venom is, not really like the alpha character you know he's kind of like the background character um in a way and uh and he's and he gets his butt kicked so again matt they call it out like shocker and matt gargan are like what right, so wolverine beat him and then the bartender's like yeah but when's the last time you went toe-to-toe -to -toe wolverine and lived uh, or didn't like get an arm or something cut off and they're just like okay but it's like yeah but he's covered in a symbiote so he has a better chance to live but matt gargan still isn't convinced he's like i don't see why this why you guys are so afraid of venom you know uh you know he's like i made a better venom than that guy i don't know why you're so afraid so then this guy shows up the guy i told you earlier who i told you is venom he pops up and he's like all right he's in disguise as another villain uh which kind of reminded me of that punisher uh war journal issue from uh, civil war like right after civil war i think it was punisher number four uh war journal number four where he like goes into the bar of bad guys and he like uh uh poisons most of them and because he's like disguised as a bartender that's kind of what's happening here so you get this revisit of venom the madness and this you know this character shows up and he says you, you don't know it's venom and he shows up he's like well let me tell you the true story of how venom uh you know fought the juggernaut and then it's like okay but then as he's telling it uh he doesn't he's pretending he's this other character he doesn't he's not he's you know obviously he's not uh, venom when he's telling the story uh but he is venom so that's, that's like the frustrating and confusing part of this is that i'm like why is he telling a false story so he has the venom the madness thing here but then it show basically the images show venom kicking the crap out of uh, juggernaut but then uh once he you know beats up juggernaut he throws him into the sewer and that's where he meets the, this character and apparently this character is the bad guy that's talking to everybody at uh, at the bar and but it's not obviously because we know it's we, we're going to find out it's Venom so he's telling the story about how Venom beat the crap out of Juggernaut but the way he's telling it is that Juggernaut won but he's not telling it that Venom won so I'm like okay I, I what's the point of the misdirection like why is Venom lying that he lost a fight against Juggernaut to this group of bad guys when he's just two seconds later going to reveal himself that he's actually Venom to take them all down. I just feel like this is one of those stories where like, like Donnie Cates is like, I have a good idea for a framing device, uh, but I don't know actually how to work out the details on it because it feels a little sloppy to me. And once again, in a Venom book, the, this is the eighth issue before issue eight, obviously, but the eighth issue of Venom that uh, Donnie Cates wrote or had a, you know, had a hand in writing. And uh, once again, it's just people sit around telling stories. I'm like, does this guy not know how to tell an actual story? Does every story he tell with Venom have to do with someone telling a story to Venom or about Venom? 
And that's what this felt like. It just felt like, oh my God, we just reviewed issue seven where Venom's sitting in a chair being told by the maker how his symbiote has been acting for the past three weeks. And uh, and now we're getting a story where a bunch of people are sitting around telling Venom stories. It's like, dude, I, I just want Eddie Brock to be like the active person who pushes forward his story without a ton of help, you know, like figuring things out on his own, problem solving on his own. And we just don't get it a ton in this in this book, and that's why I'm on the fence. Like there are a lot of things in here that are fun that that work for me on a, on like a, a more basic level, and a lot of things that I know a lot of you guys like. And some of you convinced me like, hey, this is actually what he was trying to say in the story. And I'm like, oh, you know what? I was wrong. Foot in mouth. That actually I like a little bit more now. But here I'm 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 not digging it. And so at the end, after you know you get the story of the Juggernaut apparently winning, even though the visuals show you him losing, um, and he tells the the, the the villain like, hey, don't tell anyone about this. And then the villain, who it's supposed to be this guy down here, is actually Venom. And so when he you know Matt Gargan is like, see, Venom's not scary. Like Juggernaut took him out too. Like he's nothing. And then it's like boom, the guy reveals himself to be Venom. And on the last page, Venom is like, all right, like, let me tell you a story. And he puts his tongue around Scorpion's head, and then everyone leaves the bar as Scorpion screams. And that's it. We don't even know if Scorpion is dead, if he just got hurt. It's, it just seems all like, you know, it's like it's, it's too f fun in a way. Like, I don't know if that's the right word. I mean, it is fun, but it's like there's no, it, there's no thought of the consequences. Like, you know, so, so someone, the next person who writes Scorpion, they probably won't even reference this storyline because it doesn't matter. Even though some of us who like the continuity will be like, well, what happened? Did Scorpion fight him and get away? Is he like on the run now? Is Scorpion on the run now? Because I liked what, uh, you know, Mike Costa did with Scorpion in the last issues of his run. And this just didn't feel like the same Scorpion. Obviously it wouldn't because it's different writers, but it still just didn't feel like in a linear way, didn't feel like it worked for me. So uh, anyway, I was going to try to go over that quickly, but uh, obviously I, I ranted about it. Uh, so uh, I, I ultimately give this book like a, you know, I don't know, like a two and a half out of five. It's okay. It was cool to see Ron Lim, you know, come back and draw something. And uh, some of the artwork, I like the stuff with uh, the Wolverine battle. I like that artwork and I like the artwork with the, uh, with the Juggernaut battle. But the bar artwork I didn't really like, and the and the framing device, although I liked overall, I didn't really like in execution. I don't think da uh, Donny Cates did a solid job with this one, in my opinion. But if you feel differently, definitely know, uh, let me know in the comments down below. All right, and let's wrap up this episode as quickly as we can. I know I'm not doing the new format. Some of you guys are probably like, hey, why aren't you flipping through the new format? With new books, I don't want to like give away a ton of the artwork, basically. I'll give away some of the pages, but I don't want to give away the whole book for free. I ultimately want you guys to go make up your own minds and read these books for yourselves, so definitely go support them. Um, so I won't go through, I won't do the new, you know, in new issues, I won't do the uh, new format that I did the other day with the minus one uh, issue. Um, so we'll just kind of briefly look at this. But first, I want to give out the digital code. So if you made it this far in the episode, boom, there's a digital code, go to that website, put that code in. First person who does gets a free digital copy of Venom number eight. And again, here we see like this symbol, which kind of is reminiscent of the uh, the, uh, the the run with Cullen Bunn and everything with Flash Thompson um, and Rick Remender. And it had like something to do with like a demonic possession thing. And I thought they were going to touch on that in this book. And they uh, they do and they don't in a way. Uh, I, uh, maybe that's like a, a different symbol. I don't know. Maybe one of you guys, because I have to reread that uh, Rick Remender and Cullen Bunn stuff. Uh, some of that I missed out on. So we are definitely going to get into Flash Thompson territory in season three here. Uh, but first, we're going to go back and, you know, reread and look at some of the early Eddie Brock stuff that we missed out on in season one. Um, but in this one, if you like Flash Thompson, I would say this is a pretty decent love letter to Flash Thompson. Overall, I understand the point of this issue, and I like the point of this issue, and I think Donny Cates did okay with it. Um, uh, certainly better than some other issues that I've read lately, including the annual. Um, but I also felt like there was a little bit of laziness here too. And my one issue with what's going on with Eddie Brock, it resurfaces in this book. So the big thing is, is I, it's so funny if you go back and watch my review of issue seven, uh, we start off here and it's like, you know, him in the cemetery looking at Flash Thompson's grave and he's talking to Flash Thompson. Uh, but then what happens is uh, we cut to the room where he's talking to the maker. And so actually this is a holographic room. And it was so funny because one of the things I said in my review of issue number seven is how come Eddie Brock is just strapped to a chair and being told everything and then they cut over for like a page or two and show Venom go on a rampage and they cut back to Eddie Brock sitting in a chair. I just thought visually that was so uninteresting and so boring and I was like, why? And I think I even made a comment, why can't this room be like a holographic room and Eddie Brock seeing all this repeated in a hologram. So maybe he's sitting there in the chair and he sees him as Venom from a couple weeks ago, you know, based on security footage, rampaging through, you know, San Francisco and ending up on his porch. And then maybe even Eddie Brock looking and seeing 
his younger brother and being like, who's, you know, who's that? Uh, I thought that would have been way more visually interesting and would have been cooler to tell that story with. And then sure as anything, this book starts off with it. So obviously, you know, Don Cates, uh, Donny Cates had the plan to make that a holographic room because clearly he did this book before my review of it. But it was just so funny that I was like, oh, why didn't he do that in the last issue? Why are we just now finding out this a holographic room in this issue? That would have made the last issue way more visually interesting where it's like Eddie Brock strapped to a chair again, sure, but at least things are happening around him. It would have just made it visually more interesting. I still would have had a problem with the chair bit. I feel like Eddie Brock needs to actually, like that issue shouldn't have been him sitting with the maker. It should have been like maybe the maker watching him while he's doing all this and sending in the troops. And at the end of the issue, he gets captured and you find out that he's, you know, under the, you know, he, the maker has him. And then you can start this issue off this way. So I would have changed around issue seven a lot and had the story actually happening in real time. And you seeing Eddie Brock being dragged around by the suit for two weeks uh, for that whole issue, as opposed to him being told he was by the maker. Uh, because again, when vi when villains tell you stuff, it's hard to like, as a reader, to accept what they're telling you because you're like, well, is any of it true? Because villains lie sometimes. Uh, they have agendas. They want to, they want something. They want something from Eddie clearly, uh, and they want something from Null. Apparently, there's a sample of Null that got taken, and it looks like Venom may have done it. Like the suit after it was you know destroyed or defeated at the end of that last arc and burnt out uh, I guess it's like you know reflexes instinctively uh, attacked those guards took the sample of the suit and hid it somewhere maybe even in San Francisco at his father's uh, house uh, so the maker is looking for it uh, actively looking for it and he has agents out there looking for it while he's sitting there talking to Eddie Brock and he took the restraints off which I'm glad I'm like oh good he's not tied up uh, you know again uh, there's no reason to for him to be I don't think the maker is really afraid too much of uh, Eddie Brock at this point so, uh, so the conversation is pretty good, uh, even though it's just Eddie Brock sitting in a chair again and being told up the plot, and he's not problem solving at all, he's not figuring out things, he's just being told stuff, and then he has to deal with what he's told, and then by the next issue, he's being told something different, and he has to, you know, it's it, that's all this book is to me, is just information being dumped on Eddie Brock, and it's like, it's too literal, it's like, hey, I know, it's like, hey, you want us, the readers, to identify with the, the main character, and you want us to learn things as he learns things, but he just keeps learning things the same way. It's by people telling him what's going on, and he's not actively finding information, and I find that weird considering he has a background as a journalist. So I would just like to see him be more active is all, is my only real complaint, is that I just wanna see him more active. I wanna see him figure things out on his own and not have to be told by villains like the Maker or Null what's going on, um, or Rex, you know, or whatever. So uh, anyway, so what he finds out is that there's, every time a symbiote leaves a body, a little bit of it stays behind. We kind of knew this. This is, you know, past continuity. We've talked about that before. Um, it also explains kind of how Carnage keeps reproducing inside Cletus Cassidy. Uh, like, you know, samples of, you know, Carnage are inside his DNA and stuff, and they're merged together. Um, but so there's a codex, essentially. So when Flash Thompson died, uh, before he did uh, this, uh, they took a, a sample of the government uh, group that he worked for, Rebirth 2.0 or whatever. They took a sample of them. And, and so his codex is still around and it can be, um, you know, shared. It, it has information on it. It's like Flash can still kind of exist temporarily or something. Um, and they're trying to figure out ways to use it, to clone it, to reproduce it, um, to rebuild him. And once that happens, the suit wake awakens and it says, you know what, you can't have him. And Eddie's like, uh, you know, like you dug him up, you dug up his body, you took a sample of him, like uh, that's wrong, it's evil, and I can't allow it to have him. I mean, it happened. So he, you know, lashes out, takes down the Maker. Uh, the Maker's not really known to be a fighter, but he does have stretchy powers, so it's actually kind of cool to see them fight. I think Ebon Coella's art, again, I love his artwork. So uh, Don Cates, as long as you keep teaming up with good artists, I'll keep buying the book because your writing for me is like 50-50 but the art is always amazing. So I'm gonna keep buying the book for the artwork most likely. Uh, but then you have this great battle and then Eddie Brock goes, he gets the sample and uh, he, he grabs it and the suit like, look, we need it to get out of here. So once again, Eddie Brock cannot wipe his own butt. Uh, and I know that's gonna sound really mean to say, uh, but that's what it is every time. It's always Eddie Brock in a pinch. Oh, okay, I gotta team up with Rex and I gotta merge with Rex to do something cool. And now he has to merge with Flash Thompson to do something cool. And this basically, like I said, this whole book is like a love letter to Flash Thompson, which I don't mind on that level. I do not mind it at all. Uh, but to say that Eddie Brock can't be a badass, uh, that, that Flash Thompson is the only badass, uh, just kind of feels like it cheapens Eddie Brock on a lot of levels. And it makes me again feel like Donny Cates doesn't really want to write an Eddie Brock story. He just wants to be the guy who explains everything out there about the symbiote 
and just touch on Eddie Brock from time to time. Uh, and then, like I said, Eddie Brock can't even do anything on his own. He has to team up with other things. So in this one, he does become Agent Venom, which visually is amazing. It's so cool to see Agent Venom as Eddie Brock tearing through here. There's a voice in his head, and the voice is of Flash Thompson, or the remains of Flash Thompson through that sample of the symbiote. So it's not really Flash, uh, but he goes around, and then there's this, like, this line where it says, uh, one thing I know for sure, uh, as Eddie Brock, is that Flash Thompson was a badass because Flash Thompson single-handedly almost uh, got Eddie Brock the heck out of there and got him to safety. So again, it's cool, it's nice, it's a nice love letter to Flash, but it also is at the detriment of taking, in my opinion, from Eddie Brock. And I understand Eddie Brock is kind of that kind of character who self-pities and self-wallows, so it makes a little bit of sense that he would be like, hey, I'm not as cool as Flash Thompson and the suit misses Flash Thompson because the Flash is what taught the suit to be a hero. And I 100% agree with all that. I think that's really awesome. And uh, and I, so I agree with it on that level. But at the same time, it's hard for me for like the, you know, third time in this book in eight issues or nine if you count the annual to see Eddie Brock uh, not be the guy, the catalyst for like change or, or action in his book. I mean, even in the last issue, he wasn't the one driving the ship when he was hiding that sample. It was the suit doing it like in its subconscious and it took over Eddie Brock. So it's like, again, Eddie can't seem to do things without uh, like a major help. And, uh, and I don't mind a, a slightly weak character who needs help from time to time, but this many times and this many issues is just getting a little old for me. So I hope after this experience, what my one takeaway from this is, is I hope that now that he's done this and he's merged with Flash temporarily and he did all those cool things, now he knows that gives him the confidence to be like that from now on. And again, we cut back to the cemetery. So he actually goes to the real cemetery this time and he talks to Flash Thompson. And uh, he's like, look, I'm going to, you know, get some rest, buddy. I'm going to take it from here and I'm not going to let you down. And, uh, and then he gets on a bus to go to San Francisco. And then you find out that Eddie Brock actually is not the one who took the suit. Some, uh, some cult is. Uh, that did that and they are preparing to share it with spoiler alert uh, they are you know so if you don't want to know uh, turn away but this will probably set up the book that comes out next week uh, they are going to share it with Carnage with Cletus Cassidy who's uh, you know in this tube here he looks burnt up he's damaged from his last uh, battles in the comic books and uh, they want to send this sample of Null give it to Cletus Cassidy to awaken Carnage and have him tapped into Null so whatever that story is I, I'm very interested in that uh, to see Carnage kind of be a knight for Null in a way and then maybe turn against Null at some point or whatever because Carnage cannot be tamed. But it'll be pretty inter uh, interesting to see. So uh, anyway, the book overall, I did like it. It's a love letter to Flash, so I accept it for that. And uh, that's why I like it overall. And the artwork is fantastic. But there are some things in this I would like to see changed. And if this is the end of Eddie Brock being like, you know, second tier or second fiddle in his own book, and if he goes forward now, and like he made the decision to get on the bus to go to San Francisco to look for that sample, Great. So now I want that to happen again. He's done that a couple times. Don Cates has done that where it's like the issue's ending and Eddie Brock's like, I'm making a decision. I'm like, yay. And then the next issue, the decision is kind of made for him or he changes his mind on it or something else gets involved. And it's like, okay, I, I just stick with it. Uh, I think you're getting uh, better with this issue. You're getting better for me, Donnie Cates. I love the first issue. I love the third issue a lot. Um, and I liked parts of um, the, the sixth issue, the finale of that first storyline. But the last issue I was kind of not feeling, and the annual I wasn't feeling. But this one I kind of did on some level because it was cool to see all that Flash stuff. And it was cool to see a love letter to Flash. But now I need you, Donny Cates, to get back to writing Eddie and making him a, you know, a catalyst for change in his own storyline. And tap into the fact that he's a journalist and that he can figure things out on his own. And that he's not just a moron uh, that has to be told everything. Uh, I want to see him actually do things. So that would be great. So I will obviously continue to read the book. I'll continue to buy the issues for now. Uh, Donnie Cates did say on Twitter the other day that he's planning a big story. It's a slow burn for him, so I'm hoping this is just the beginning of his arc, and he, you know, he'll and, and Eddie will become the Venom that we all want him to be. Uh, but it, it's it is taking time, and normally I'm okay with that. But at right now, it's like, but there's also continuity things, and there's other things in the way of it, you know, advancing at a at a, a slightly quicker rate. And so I, you know, I don't want. Donny Cates to get too caught up in this like mega 50 issue blockbuster run that he's doing with like space knights and you know and like uh, you know like the null of the space god and you know it's I feel like he's just getting way into this big territory uh, that is like it's fine on some level because I want an interesting story told with Venom and it's something we haven't really seen before in Venom so I'm kind of digging it on that level 
But at the same time, I feel like he's getting so caught up in that that the issue to issue beats uh, he's not focusing on, and that's kind of frustrating for me. So I hope uh, you know he gets a better hang uh, yeah, handle on this. And with him writing a ton of other books coming up, I'm getting a little word that his workload's going to get stretched thin. So I hope this book doesn't suffer um, any more than to me that already has. But I know a lot of you guys out there feel different. You love the book a lot more than I do. So if so, let me know down below what were your favorite uh, moments from this issue or the annual. I'd love to hear it down below. And thank you for sticking with me for like this 25 minute video. I really appreciate it. Didn't think it was going to go this long, but I'm glad it did. So you had at least a good conversation from me uh, while I'm on bed rest, you know, from my surgery and stuff. So let me know your thoughts down below. And once I'm better, I will respond to them and we'll continue our conversation down there. Thanks so much for watching my show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you in the future. Peace.